Scanning for audio. Welcome once again to a Tin Dog Podcast. Yes, I am trying to catch up, so thank you for bearing with me. I'll try and record a few podcasts this week and pace myself over the next few, releasing a few at a time as we need them. But before we discuss DVDs, I just want to say, well, the competition's over. You know, the shorter one. Yeah, that's the one. Well, it was won by Simon Hudson, and he's currently sent me a little email saying thanks for the book. There will be more competitions, I'm sure, at some point. Before I do review The Demons, John Pertwee's greatest story in many people's views, I just want to say that I've been working for Starburst magazine, doing reviews of Doctor Who, which is all very nice and pleasant, except that presents me with a problem. You see, once I've written these reviews, I've sat down with the DVDs and my little notebooks and done the sort of thing that's produced reasonably good Tin Dog podcasts over the years. These reviews get sent off, become the copyright of the magazine or online edition, depending on where they want to print them, and then I can't read them out. You see, if I've done the work for them, it makes sense. So what I've done is I've got all these notes, and I've got them all in a coherent pattern, and I've written it all up, and I can't just read it out. Which presents us with a problem. You see, I've got lovely notes about the demons, but I can't just read them out. So what I've done is... I've read my notes, I've got my original notebooks out, and now I can go back and do the podcast. I'm sure you understand, it's not very interesting, but it is important. Or is it the other way around? Ah, who cares? Let's talk about Uncle John's finest hour, shall we? When Beltane is come, tread softly, for lo, the prince himself is nigh. Devil's End. The very name sends a shiver in the spine. There is something strange about Devil's End. Puzzle! 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 Suppose something was to happen and nobody knew the explanation. Nobody in the world, in the universe. Well, that would be magic, wouldn't it? You saw the devil. Yes. Satan, Lucifer, the prince of darkness, the horned beast. Hearken to my voice, O dark one, ancient and awful. Call him what you like, he was there. Be present here at my command and truly do my will. Stop, don't pull that stone, don't! As my will, so mote it be. What is me is the choice. Domination for the master, master, or total annihilation. We're all in mortal danger. Everyone in the village. Everyone in the whole world. Jump with the wings there. Five rounds left. Oh, my dear son, kill him. Kill him now. Don't obey me. No. There are quite a lot of fans out there who have the demons in well. A high regard, and I must admit, I'm kind of one of them. I've always loved it, from the first time I saw it on VHS with the dodgy recolorization. I was happy. Yeah, I know it owes a lot to other sources, um, midwitch cuckoos, and well, let's face it, more than a slight nod in the direction of Quatermass. But you know, Doctor Who's good at that. It takes stuff that's gone before, gives it its own little twist repackages it and gives it back to us and we're happy as larry to go on if you've taken enough from different sources and given it back to us we're happy because it becomes its own entity in itself and that i can so live with now your plot for this story is relatively straightforward and as long as you don't think about it too much i'm sure you can kind of accept it sleepy english village Yes, we're back in a sleepy English village. We are still on John Pertwee's time, which means he's stuck on Earth in said sleepy village. Now, this is at the end of the series 
where Joe turned up. But more importantly, it's the series where the master was the villain in absolutely every story. You're going to guess who the villain is here, aren't you? Well, Mr. Magister, and I'm doing that little rabbit ears, is the new vicar. And the new vicar in town has access to the cavern. That's the cavern, and not the crypt underneath the church, as to not offend any Christians. Not offending people is very, very good in this story. The story takes place at Devil's End, and of course the Devil's Hump. Apparently, a long, long time ago, an alien race who, rather unfortunately, looked like demons, see Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood End, turned up and started messing about, giving us the odd nudge in the right direction. Think Scaroth of Jaggeroth, but with better kit. We basically became their lab rats. Yes, I know it kind of goes against the large queen spider backstory for the Earth, but let's not bother getting involved there. The Earth's been messed about by so many aliens it's not worth going into, and let's not even think about the whole beast trapped underneath the black hole that David Tennant met. Whether he was the devil or not, I'd rather not go into. This story is five episodes long, which is well worth remembering for a Doctor Who pub quiz, because there's not a lot of five-episode stories. It isn't slow. More right, it might be slow by today's TV standards, but as far as I'm concerned, it's well worth just, you know, shoving on the DVD player and just letting it wash over you. I'll make no bones of the fact that whenever I'm stressed, I will put on a John Pertwee story just to while the hours away. And when it was VHS time, this VHS took a hell of a hammering. Where was I? Oh yeah, discussing the plot. Well, again, the Doctor's going to turn up and try and stop, basically, Time Team from digging up the vault. Oh, did I mention there was a local witch? She's fantastic. I've always had leanings in the Wiccan direction, and this witch is fantastic. She doesn't go down the obvious doddery old bint route. She takes the part and makes it her own. It's one of the greatest performances in Doctor Who, never mind in a Pertwee era. A strong female with very definite views without becoming a stereotype. Yes, she can handle herself. And yes, she has connections. But that's fine. Oh, of course, did I mention Time Team? Well, of course, that's Channel 4. And here we have the very first mentioning of BBC Three. Oddly enough, there's a documentary being made on BBC Three. That's the BBC Three in this episode of Doctor Who. About the digging up of the Devil's Hump in order to promote the guy's book. But the thing worthy of mention is that this would be the very first documentary shown by BBC Three that I could actually want to watch, as opposed to the man whose wife was a handbag, or whatever they show these days. Now, that sounds still too far, far too highbrow. It would have to be something terribly seedy. Hmm, maybe I've got all BBC Four in my old age. Well, sue me, I don't care. I've rambled on far too much about the plot. Look, basically, it's a fantastic story. In these enlightened days of Doctor Who fandom, it has got its detractors. Everybody used to say it was the world's most perfect Doctor Who story. It's not perfect. The Brigadier does feel a bit wasted in it, but he's got some of the best lines in Brigadier history in this. The reason it being so good? Well, it's been written by Guy Leopold, a man who doesn't really exist. Guy Leopold is Barry Letts and his mate. They got together and wrote something that basically played to everyone's strengths. And it's so obvious. John's just spot on. All the local villagers have got just enough characterization to stop them becoming cardboard without making them too foreground a character. Yes, Box a bit ropey and Azael's tights, well, you know, what can I say? Invasion of the Norabati aliens. But perhaps... These aliens have wrinkly legs. The guy's been shrunk down to the size of, well, an atom for thousands of years. He's going to be a little bit crumpled. Leave him alone. The guy playing the main demon, of course, went on to play Omega. Nice, booming voice. Gets my vote every time. Whether or not it was a mistake all along to have Roger Delgado as the villain for the entire series, we'll never really know. I must admit, it's not my favourite ideas, but if you don't watch them in order... It's perfectly fine, and Roger is simply superb as the master. In this story, there are definite themes. There are themes in most Doctor Who stories. But the themes worthy of commenting on are A. Science trumps religion in a game of Doctor Who top trumps. No such thing as magic, you know the whole Clark's Law thing. 
magic is needed and has its fiddly affectations, but just, just in order to make the science work. It's never truly explained at what point the magic becomes science, so that bit I suppose you have to leave. There's a whole techno babble about psychokinetic forces and ritual and the like, and just enough to make you happy. And by the way, the rituals, well, that's Mary Mary quite contrary. How does your garden grow played backwards, apparently? The other themes, well, they're slightly more obvious. You can see them played out time and time again. Most recently in, say, The Lodger, love and self-sacrifice will always conquer evil, regardless of its power and its menace. These themes come up time and time again, and every time they do come up, you start going, oh, it doesn't really feel right, it feels like a bit of a cop-out. But hey, this is Doctor Who, let it go, you can't win them all. So, what does this disc have as its extras? Well, first off, there's a really nice commentary over the entire five episodes just make up disc one of the set. Disc two has the rest of the extras on it. The Devil All Rides Out. Cast and crew talk about the making of the story. Perfectly acceptable making of. One thing that is missing from this is Return to Devil's End, a sort of fan-made DVD. You can track it down on YouTube, and if you've got the right kit, download it and make your own video. But it would be nice to have this on DVD. I'm sure on eBay you can find signed copies. Getting back to the list, you've got Remembering Barry Letts. That's a look at the life and work of Barry. It's brilliant. It's a great little documentary. Location filming. This is lovely. A, a mute 8 mil film shot of the villages of Oldbourne, and that's during the location. It's just exquisite to watch. Now, originally, one of the episodes was colourised using fairly analogue technology back in 1992 before it was released on VHS. Basically, the video was stretched. That's an American edition of the video available on Betamax. Hooray for Betamax, the superior system. Oh, really need to be letting that go. And it was this Betamax off-air video, which didn't have the greatest quality of image, which was placed behind the colour information, a really nice black and white version. It's all explained here on an episode of Tomorrow's World, rather quaint technology. But it was so much more fun than just pressing a button on a computer and go, go ahead, do it. There's Radio Times listing, program subtitles, which I still love and I will so miss. Photo gallery and are coming soon. All digitally remastered. Right, enough rambling about this. I'll fade away and let you get on with something better. Oh, there may be something for you after the titles. There may not. Either way, be seeing you. You have been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk We come now to the special award presented in honour of Dennis Potter. We're lucky to have not one but two presenters. The mere mention of the names of these two fine young actors is enough to elicit the most extraordinary noises from the most discerning of company. The term quirky sexy apparently doesn't even do them justice. They're not my type. I'm more of a beefcake man myself. But nonetheless, <laughs> please welcome Matt Smith and Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, with the title as tantalizing as the BAFTA Special Award, it surely goes without saying that the recipient is a person we are here to celebrate, obviously, and to lord and to praise. And he is someone... Special. Very special. This is someone very special indeed, if a little grumpy when uh, behind with his writing, which he generally is, and his scripts are generally late, but it doesn't matter because when they arrive, boom, they are brilliant. But impossible to learn. They are impossible to learn. So when they asked us to do this, the only condition was that he had to recite uh, all of Gilbert and Sullivan's modern major general, delivered double time and from memory. But from anyone lucky enough to have been in a read-through with the man known as the Moffinator, they'll know that that's a work in the park. Is that an impression? No. 
Yes, it was. Um, the man is a word machine. He is Holmes. He has the heart of the doctor, well, one of them at least. We're lucky to be here because of his latest triumphs in reinventing Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who, although his work spans 20 years from the press gang to Tintin. His name is a byword for quality family entertainment and has resulted in more awards than he has hair, which is a lot. And, uh, well, what else can you say about the man? He's, uh, he's fond of red wine. He doesn't really know who the Beatles were. He's a loving and non-misogynist husband to the equally brilliant but far more beautiful wife, Sue Virtue. And coolest dads to have to the equally cool Louis and Josh. His children Hello, are man. cool. Uh, what else can I bore you with and embarrass him with? Uh, me and Karen and Arthur call him the moth. A bit like the hoth, but clever and Scottish and pale. Uh, uh, he is a bad but funny dancer, and he has a sort of wonderful propensity to be brilliantly cantankerous about the world, which is one of the things I love about him. He makes me laugh. I hope he keeps writing for many years to come. Did he write that? No. I thought so. It was terrible. Actually, he did. It was brilliant. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, without any further delay, let's look at the master at work. Don't turn your back. Don't look away. And don't blink. From the groundbreaking press gang to the cutting-edge Sherlock, Stephen Moffat has been writing some of Britain's favourite TV shows for over 20 years. His ability to blend comedy and drama has delighted audiences since day one. I happen to like the contrast. I happen to like comedy drama. I happen to like being not categorisable. Mm. Can you give us any idea of the plot? No. I thought you were time agents. You're not, are you? Just a couple more freelancers. Oh. I think it's perfectly acceptable that humour is a part of drama. It's a part of life, you know? Tell me, why on earth you would want me to sit on one of these? If you pressed it firmly against your bottom, it might stop you talking! <laughs> Where? Generally speaking, are a man's brains located at around the time of conception? You wearing any pants? No. Okay. Now there's an idea. Why don't we tell them about the dangers? Drugs can kill you. What a headline. Next week, why it's bad to fall off high buildings. Sherlock! Stephen owes his breakthrough hit Press Gang to his father, Bill, who pitched an idea about a school newspaper to a visiting ITV producer. Has anyone ever told you you've got a wonderful vocabulary? I always knew that. Just could never put it into words. Stephen mined his personal life for funny characters and stories about human relationships for the sitcoms Joking Apart, Chalk and Coupling. The truth for once, don't tell a stupid lie. I've got a wooden leg. In 2005, Stephen realised a lifelong ambition, joining the writing team of the new look Doctor Who. I don't give my screwdriver to anyone. I'm not anyone. Don't you ever get tired of Doctor? Doctor Who? Nine centuries in, I'm coping. Where have you been? Your coming was foretold. There's no such thing as foretelling. Trust a time traveller. Something big's coming, isn't it? Working on Doctor Who with Mark Gatiss led to the pair bringing Sherlock Holmes into the 21st century. There's a margin for error, but I'm pretty sure this is 7.47, leaving Heathrow tomorrow at 6.30 in the evening for Baltimore. Apparently it's going to save the world. I'm not sure how that could be true, but give me a moment. I'm going to be another case for eight seconds. When a fictional character starts keeping secrets from the writer, that's when that character becomes real. Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You gotta admit that's sexier. Please don't feel obliged to tell me that was remarkable or amazing. How do you get to be so <laughs> clever? Give reasons for people not to turn off. And gentlemen, it gives us great pleasure it does. to announce that the winner of this year's BAFTA Special Award goes to our colleague and great friend, Mr. Mr. Stephen, Stephen Moffat. Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who <laughs> giving me an award. That is absolutely brilliant. That's all I really need to say. When I was first told about this, I started getting interviews because it was announced a short while ago. And the very first interview I got 
Uh, the interviewer asked me the best ever first question about this kind of award. He said, wouldn't you rather win a proper BAFTA? <laughs> to which I entirely failed to reply, no. This is, when I got that letter, simply the proudest moment. Indeed, when I got that letter, I showed it to my son because I, I couldn't quite make out the truth of it. I thought, Dennis Potter and me on the same page. Look, look, it's me and Dennis Potter. It's a proper big award. I'm a real writer. I am so inadequate to this award, there are more than the usual number of people to thank. So I will skip very fast people, about past people I should be talking about, like Sandra Hasty and Ben Stevenson, and talk about the two shows that got me here tonight, let's be honest. On, uh, on Doctor Who, it was Piers Wenger and Beth Willis who carried me through the first two years, often by the hair. The thankless task has now fallen to uh, Kara Skinner and Marcus Wilson. And on Sherlock, I can't but mention my brilliant friend and most brilliant collaborator, and in the words of Doyle himself, never better applied, the best and wisest man I have ever known, Mark Gatiss. <laughs> and in many ways, the least sung, but most deserving hero of Sherlock, the woman, the producer, Sue Virtue, the best and wisest woman I have ever married. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, BAFTA, for Tommy. Good night. Mm -hmm.